In my previous video, I mentioned that future ones would dive into subjects somewhat off the beaten path. We're about to step pretty far off that path by talking about some technology that was largely obsolete even as it was being installed on the ship and replaced after only 11 years of service. Before we start, let me take a few seconds to tell you how you can help Battleship Texas. She has just completed extensive hull repairs and is now back in the water. Continuing work on guns, replacing the wood on the main deck, and renovation to her superstructure are continuing using grants and private donations. If you want to help save this unique military treasure, you can do so by visiting the link in this video's description that will take you to Battleship Texas Foundation store where you can purchase memorabilia that even includes items made from the ship's steel and old wood deck. Firing boilers with coal was nasty and difficult. Unfortunately, it was the only fuel available in adequate quantities until oil finally reached large-scale production in the early 20th century and distributed on a global scale. Only then was coal shoveled into the bin of obsolete technology. Coal was filthy, difficult to take on board, stoking boilers with it was hot and laborious, and it could even catch fire or explode under the wrong conditions. Except for the galley crew and band, the entire ship's crew turned out and suffered through the filthy refueling process that could take a day or longer. Taking on coal required tying up to a fueling dock, a coaling ship called a collier, or barges. It was dumped in huge piles on the ship's main deck using chutes, large buckets, or even hand-loaded bags. From there it was moved with wheelbarrows and shoveled by hand through deck openings called scuppers into the coal bunkers. Needless to say, no one wept when oil-fired boilers were installed. Texas and New York were the last American battleships to use coal as fuel. The disadvantage was so pronounced, it served as a major reason for the ships being considered for decommissioning and scrapping after less than 10 years of service. What saved both was the Washington Naval Arms Limitation Treaty of 1922 that stopped all new battleship construction for 10 years. It not only made keeping them necessary, it also made installing new oil-fired boilers economically possible. Numbers of modern oil-fired boilers were sitting unused in warehouses made surplus by canceled ship projects. The result was Texas, New York, and a couple of earlier battleships got new leases on life that improved their service and reliability, increased their steaming capacities, and almost doubled their ranges. While no one wanted the move away from coal, something was lost in the change that deserves our attention. The superb Babcock and Wilcox coal-fired marine boilers. Their design not only got the most from coal, they were able to digest anything from the finest hand-picked New River and Welsh anthracite to the trashiest low-quality lignite found on the far side of the world. That in itself was no small feat. For most of the 19th century, most marine boilers used a fire tube design that suffered significant shortcomings. They were large, heavy, and heated a very large volume of water to create steam. Most only generated pressures of 200 pounds per square inch or less. Their limited ability to make steam resulted in ships having to carry large numbers of boilers. For instance, Titanic was equipped with 24 double-ended fire tube boilers that required a total of 48 crews of coal passers and stokers working at both ends of each when all boilers were fired. Fortunately, the U.S. Navy had switched to a very different design by the beginning of the 20th century. Texas was fitted with 14 of the far more efficient and compact Babcock and Wilcox small tube water design that was capable of producing all of her steam needs. The result was tremendous savings in fuel consumption, space, weight, and the crews needed to operate them. By the late 1890s, Babcock and Wilcox had established itself as a leader in the manufacture of small water tube boilers for a variety of uses. Their designs contained small diameter tubes mounted in a furnace through which water flowed and steam created. This offered multiple benefits. They were smaller and lighter than fire tube boilers. Their smaller volume of water had more direct exposure to heat through the surfaces of the hundreds of tubes, meaning it could be heated much more quickly. The result was a greatly improved ability to respond to sudden and large changes in steam demand. Lastly, their uses of smaller components and shapes allowed operating pressures of 300 PSI for significantly improved efficiency. While they offered major improvements in design and function, small water tube boilers had their own issues. They required constant attention and skilled operation. Rapid changes in steam demand could quickly drop water levels in the drum and water tubes. If robbed of the cooling provided by direct contact with water inside of them, tubes would be almost instantly damaged or completely fail in the intense heat. Buildup of scale inside the tubes could quickly lower their efficiency and even create hot spots that led to failure. However, these issues were worth dealing with since they were readily solved by good crew training and discipline and careful monitoring and control of water purity. 
Let's dig a little deeper into the use of coal. There are two major variables that limits the amount of steam a coal-fired boiler can generate, the size of its fire grate and the total surface area of its water tubes. Quite simply, the larger the fire grate, the more coal one can burn at any moment to create heat. Those on Texas's boilers had a size of 7 feet deep by almost 16 feet wide or about 111 square feet surface area. There was also a limit to the amount of coal that could be put on a fire grate and still get good combustion. If the coal bed is too thick, air can't pass through it in the quantities required for good combustion. Likewise, if it's too shallow, unconsumed air will pass through the bed and cool the fire. Knowing and maintaining the proper depth of an evenly spread coal bed required a lot of experience and a good eye by the stoker. The other variable was the surface area of the water tubes in which steam was produced. Tubes were bundled into sets of four that were fed water and discharged steam through headers at each end. Their walls acted as interfaces through which heat from burning gases passed to generate steam. Even though each tube had a small diameter and small surface area, each of Texas's coal-fired boilers contained 892 of them. If you took each tube, split it, and rolled it flat, their combined area equaled 1,554 square feet of tube surface through which heat could pass. That's the same size as the floor space of a medium-sized house. It should be clear that the two variables were very closely related since fire grate size determined fire size and heat production and tube surface area determined how much heat would pass to the water and generate steam. This relationship can be expressed as a ratio, which in this case was 40 to 1 tube generating surface to fire grate size. That was a very good number. A smaller ratio would allow fast steaming response, but a lot of heat would pass through and out the smokestack. Conversely, a larger ratio would result in more water than available heat needed to create the steam. Even that large number of tubes didn't get the most out of the heat of burning coal. If you take a closer look at the firebox, you'll see two additional rows of tubes suspended below its sloped roof that took heat directly off the fire. Water jackets also ran along both sides of the firebox that served double duty. They not only added to the generation of steam, they also acted as barriers that substantially reduced the heat conducted through to the boiler side walls and escaped into the room. There's one last thing to notice about all of the tubes in the water jackets. All are tilted at a 15 degree upward angle from front to rear. This created the lift needed to force steam bubbles to rise from the lower headers containing incoming water to rear headers where steam is collected and sent to the steam water drum. The speed and manner that hot gases moved across the tubes was also very important. Burning gas flowed very quickly, meaning it could move between the tubes and leave through the uptake without passing much of its heat to the tubes. To slow things down and improve circulation around the tubes, they were bundled into groups of four and placed in staggered rows rather than being neatly lined up. With that, gases slowed as they curved back and forth around the bundles and were forced to more completely surround the tubes. The result was better heat transfer and more uniform heating of tube surfaces. Gases were also carefully routed as they moved in the firebox, around the tubes, and out the uptake. It started in the firebox whose roof was sloped, becoming taller toward the rear. This encouraged complete mixture with air for maximum combustion and directed the superheated gases into the tube bundles. It was there that a series of baffles routed them up across the tubes, back down to cross them again, and then up again one more time before being exhausted through the uptake. The three changes in direction slowed the gases down even more and provided three opportunities for them to give up their heat to the tubes. So that's how heat moved, but what about water and steam? It started with feed water preheated almost to boiling point and injected into the steam water drum. That kept it from condensing freshly made steam and reduced thermal shock to hot metal parts inside the drum. Once inside the drum, water was directed toward the lower tube headers by a baffle and from there into the water tubes. Conversion of water to steam occurred along the length of the tubes. As it expanded and turned into steam, the 15 degree upward tube tilt caused it to rise from the low end and into the upper headers through which it passed into a rows of large circulating tubes at the top of the boiler. From there, the steam spewed from the tubes into the water steam drum, completing the loop. As it shot into the drum, steam was directed downward by another baffle to reduce splashing in the space at the top of the drum. It then rose and separated from the water where it entered the dry pipe that ran along the top of the drum's full length. Openings were located only in the top of the pipe for a very important reason. This greatly reduced water splashing into them since the pipe itself acted to block it. The goal was to reduce priming, which are slugs of liquid water entering the steam line. 
Think of priming as high-velocity water bullets that shot through the pipes and struck joints and entered equipment. It was to be avoided at all costs since it was extremely damaging. It was extremely important to control water level in the steam water drum, but hard to do since it could only be seen through small sight glasses. Levels could suddenly jump with engine speed changes and when other equipment was turned on and off. If too high, priming would occur that could damage pipes and equipment. If too low, tubes may be uncovered and melt. The water tender had to always be aware of water level, instantly know how to respond to a problem, predict what was about to happen, and even when to mistrust what he saw. Both the ship's original coal-fired boilers and later oil-fired boilers were equipped with superheaters. These were coils that routed steam back through the boiler's uptake to pick up more heat and greatly improve efficiency. However, those on the coal-fired boilers were rarely used and those on the later oil-fired boilers were completely removed. The reason was the ship's big reciprocating engines relied upon water condensation from normal steam for cylinder lubrication that would not have been provided by the very dry superheated steam. Passers, stokers, and trimmers were also hard at work at the bottom of the boiler. Passers shoveled coal out of bulkhead openings called scuppers and threw it within reach of the stokers. As levels dropped inside of the bunkers, trimmers inside of them shoveled coal to the scuppers where it could be reached by the passers. Stokers moved along the front of the boiler where they flipped four doors open one at a time with their shovel and threw coal into the firebox. The goal was to maintain a bright yellow flame by controlling the thickness of the bed of coal. As it burned down, he scattered fresh loads of coal across the grate behind each door to maintain proper thickness. He also looked for bright spots in the bed that were thin areas that received an extra shovel full. He continued the process one door at a time until the boiler was properly charged. There was also the filthy and difficult chore of cleaning boiler tubes, ash pits, and fires. Soot collected on the outside of boiler tubes, reducing their ability to transfer heat. Side doors were periodically opened, and compressed air wands were inserted between the tubes to blow soot off and out the smokestack. Regardless of coal quality, fires gradually got dirty, so the coal bed was pushed to one side of the grate, and accumulated trash was cleared before re-leveling it. Ash pit doors were opened one at a time, and cooling seawater hosed onto the ashes, cinders, and broken clinkers as they were raked out onto the deck. The resulting sludge was then shoveled into wheelbarrows and taken to an ash ejector located on each side of the room where it was dumped into a hopper. Its lid was shut and a water valve opened that pushed the refuse up through a pipe and through openings in the ship's hull above the water line. Even though the Babcock and Wilcox boilers were excellent state-of-the-art designs, nothing could overcome the inefficiency, filth, and difficulty of burning coal. As the rush to oil-fired boilers began, Early boilers were largely carryovers of old coal-fired designs that had their grates and doors removed and oil burners installed. While this solved most of the problems, fuel oil burns very differently than coal and produces flames that simply didn't work well in them. As a result, new designs were created that took better advantage of the new fuel source. The Dyson small water tube boiler sprang from the mind of a naval engineering genius, Charles Dyson, and is a great example of the next generation of boiler design. It was a superb 300-pound steam boiler that was cleaner to operate, more reliable, easier to control, and could produce far more steam than any coal-fired boiler. After going through a very quick development cycle, it became the boiler of choice for battleships, battle cruisers, and aircraft carriers, and went into production at several factories that included Bureau Express, who made those that are now on Texas. By using them in its change to fuel oil, Battleship Texas was saved from complete obsolescence that would have doomed her to the scrap heap and allowed her to earn her place as a serious player in World War II naval history.